Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about what bias is in the context of observational studies. And we're going to talk about two kinds of bias, stage migration and immortal time bias. And uh, this will be particularly of interest to people um, in the cancer field, because these two phenomena relate a lot to cancer research. And I'm going to choose examples from upper GI and colorectal surgery. So if there are any GI trainees, hopefully uh, this will capture their imagination. Right. So let's just talk about what observational studies are. So there's a separate tutorial on uh, observational studies and study designs, um, and that's on YouTube. So you might want to have a quick look at that. And I'm going to provide a very brief uh, running uh, summary of what observational studies are. So essentially, these are studies that do not necessarily aim to evaluate an intervention and do not intervene in the natural history of the disease. So these are just observational processes. So um, just to look at some examples, what kind of questions are potentially answerable with an observational design? Some examples in the field of thyroid surgery are um, some research questions as examples are, what is the prognosis of low risk thyroid cancer? So that's going to be an observational study. Uh, you, you, you build a bit, big database of thyroid cancer patients, uh, identify the ones that, uh, uh, ones that are classified as low risk based on whatever criteria, pick out some prognostic factors you want to study, and just run over time to see whether you can use those prognostic factors to relate to uh, clinical outcomes. Another question could be, what are the outcomes of patients undergoing hemi versus total thyroidectomy? Now, you could say, is this really observational? It depends on the context and the setting. If you're going to run a randomized controlled trial and randomly allocate some patients to a hemi and some patients to a total, then that's not an observational study. However, if you're going to compare two cohorts of patients, maybe from different hospitals, one of whom usually has a hemithyroidectomy as per their standard practice, and another group undergoes total thyroidectomy because that's a practice in that other center, then you can uh, compare the outcomes in these two groups and you can still call that an observational study because you haven't intervened in what is naturally going to happen to those patients. You're simply collecting data on patients and that are um, undergoing different treatments. So if you want to understand patients' attitudes and perceptions of radioiodine treatment, for example, that would be an observational study because you're not changing practice with regards to radioiodine, you're simply observing their perceptions. If you wanted to look at the role of ultrasound in cytology and thyroid cancer diagnosis, Again, this could be observational if you um, are not doing more ultrasound scans or doing more cytology and simply looking at what is already being done. So I hope that clarifies what observational studies are. So essentially, they evaluate the relationship between different variables. Now, in most observational studies, there is a variable called or categorized as exposure. And there's another variable that you could call an endpoint. Now, in some studies, where you're looking at a risk factor um, and the occurrence of disease, the risk factor is the exposure and the occurrence of disease is the endpoint. Like, for example, tobacco smoking and lung cancer. In some other kinds of observational studies, you have treatments and you want to uh, evaluate the relationship of the treatment with a specific outcomes just such as survival or recurrence. So here, the treatment is the exposure and the clinical outcome and um, which could be survival or recurrence is the endpoint. Right, so the three main types of observational studies. Again, very briefly, you've got the case control group of studies where you start off with the endpoint and then you look back to see where the exposures occurred. So you start off with healthy people and people with the disease, and then you look to see um, you know, what kind of uh, exposure they've had to the risk factor in each of these two groups. The second type of observational studies are the cohort studies. 
where you don't start with the endpoint, you start with the exposure to either the risk factor or the treatment. And then over time, you look to see if the endpoint has occurred or the outcome has occurred. And so, uh, uh, so these are cohort studies. And the third main group of observational studies is what we call cross-sectional studies, where you evaluate both the endpoint and the exposure together uh, at, at, at any point in time. There are some other kinds of observational studies that we won't go into any detail now. And these are ecological studies and proportional mortality studies, but uh, they're not um, really, um, they don't fall within the scope of this talk. Right. So we've learned what observational studies are, or we've had a quick revision, and now we move on to what a bias is. So a bias is something that systematically deviates the results of a study from the truth. The word systematic is key. As opposed to error, which is simply a mistake that is random, that is not systematic. So it could be an act of commission or omission. Now let's uh, just look at uh, an example. So let's say you, we are looking at a trial that's comparing laparoscopic versus open colorectal surgery in an acute setting, akin to the trial that we just discussed. A bias in the conduct of this trial would could be something like you include surgeons with very little laparoscopic experience and then randomize patients um, who need either open or laparoscopic surgery to those surgeons. So they'll, they'll obviously be adept at doing open surgery, but maybe not so much with laparoscopic surgery, and therefore you're introducing bias. So that's one example. It could be that you have surgeons who are recruiting patients who know what um, is going to come next in the random sequence. So if they have a prejudice um, against a specific treatment, that might bias their recruitment, and you might uh, it might lead to what you call selection bias. It could be that there's a high rate of protocol deviation or dropouts. Let's say, for example, you randomized quite a few patients to open surgery, and they then, after randomization, before being wheeled into theater, have expressed a clear wish to have laparoscopic surgery. Now, this happens very frequently. That's going to significantly bias your results. So that's another example of bias. How about errors in these kinds of studies? Errors are, like I say, very random simple mistakes, maybe sometimes not so simple, but examples are things like, um, you have included a patient who actually did not meet all your eligibility criteria, and that was a mistake. And you uh, or the researcher has um, made some errors in transcribing what's in the operation note into the data collection form. That could be a mistake. Uh, if you've got the incorrect date of discharge, for example, instead of 11 days in hospital, you've got one day in hospital, and if you're comparing length of stay in the two groups, then that's a mistake. So I hope this clearly explains the difference between bias and error. Now, when we say error in this context, this is different to the errors we talk about in clinical research and um, where we categorize uh, results of the study in testing a null hypothesis. And if you have errors there, you call them type one and type two errors. Those errors, um, are uh, are relevant in another context and, and not um, doesn't relate to the type of errors that we've just discussed. Okay, so I'm hoping that makes sense. Now, you've got to keep in mind that bias can occur at any stage in um, a trial. So from the planning stage, conduct, analysis, and reporting, you can have bias in, uh, at any um, point in time. Now, I've got a few examples of bias at each stage of a, um, of a study, and these are all on the screen here. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail um, into all of these uh, biases, and these are just examples of numerous types of biases um, that can take place in every part of the study. So, just a few examples. So, if you look at flawed uh, study design, so if you've got a study design that's probably a case control study, um, which may not be appropriate um, for a study that, uh, which really wants to estimate risk of a particular outcome from a, from a risk factor. Uh, you want to get a good estimate of risk. You really need relative risk, and a case control study is not suited to uh, give you relative risk. Then you've got to design for right at the start. Yeah. So if, uh, for example, um, uh, detection bias. So if um, 
there is a problem with um, uh, with diagnosing a, a condition on an imaging study uh, and you do not um, ensure that the radiologists who are interpreting the images have a clear understanding of the requirements of the study and you don't validate the radiologist interpretation, then you've got a problem. That's detection bias. Uh, an example for bias during analysis would be a grouping bias. That's a good example. So we previously discussed um, the principles of analysis in randomized controlled trials. We talked about intention to treat analysis and uh, per protocol analysis. And, and in intention to treat analysis, you analyze the patients according to the arm that they were randomized to, regardless of whether they got that treatment. And if you don't do it that way, you'll have a grouping bias. You would have put the patient in the group that you were intending to, and that'll be a problem. And in in reporting, you can have something called publication bias. Uh, you all probably know that um, studies that have negative results or, or results that are not very exciting struggle to get published and they don't come to uh, come into the limelight. Uh, and more and more studies of those kinds may be done. Um, uh, and then uh, if you're doing a meta-analysis, and you're looking for all studies in a particular area and you're basing your retrieval of studies based on what is published, then you might not get the studies that haven't made it into print because they had negative results. So that could bias the results of your meta-analysis. Okay, so, so, so much for bias and the types of bias. And now we're going to discuss a specific um, kind of bias called the stage migration bias. So what does this mean? So here's a, an interesting quote. And um, you probably haven't heard of Will Rogers. Will Rogers was an American comedian uh, from the early 20th century. And one day, I think on stage, he said, uh, when the Okies left Oklahoma for and moved to California, they raised the average intelligence level in both states. A uh, bit of an awkward statement to make and in front of um, um, people uh, who were uh, probably from both Oklahoma and California. Now, if you uh, think about this statement a little bit and see how can this happen? How can movement of people from one state to another raise the average IQ in both states? The only way this can happen is if you move a cohort that is below average in its current location, i.e. Oklahoma, to a location where their IQ is above average uh, in the new location. So you might have to think about this. If you're watching this in video format, you might have to pause the video and have a little think to see um, if this makes sense. And then you're starting to wonder, you know, oh, what is he on about? Well, how does this relate to <laughs> clinical research? And then hopefully the next two slides will explain that. But let's consider the example of gastric cancer. And I don't know if you're aware that for de decades there has been this uh, perception that gastric cancer patients in Japan do much better than their counterparts in the Western world. There have been lots of studies from, uh, from the US and Germany um, that have shown survival rates that are much, much inferior to the reports from Japan. And people for, uh, for ages have wondered about why this is the case. So um, this consistent difference in survival between a series of gastric cancer patients in Japan compared to the Western world. And a number of reasons have been postulated. The surgeons in Japan have been saying that it's the surgery that they do, the extent of dissection, D2, D3 dissection, and that's what improves the survival. People in the West have commented on genetic differences and phenotypic differences. People have commented that the average BMI in Japan and for the average patient is much lower than and people in the West, and therefore um, radical surgery is quite difficult to do. People have also commented on the use of aggressive adjuvant treatment in Japan compared to the US. And the debate has, um, has gone on and is still going on to a certain extent. So what then as, um, researchers did was they categorized the cohorts, the cohorts of gastric cancer patients in Japan by stage, and then they compared their, their prognosis. So you um, categorize patients in Japan into stage one, two, three, and four. I won't go into the details of the stages. Uh, I presume a lot of you will know that stage one and two relate to the extent of um, disease within the wall of the stomach. Stage two, three relates to uh, 
lymph nodes, lymph nodal involvement, and stage four relates to distant disease. Now, I don't know much about gastric cancer myself, but this is a general rule for most solid cancer. So stage four stage, when they looked at the survival between Japanese cancer patients and American patients, they found here yeah, that stage four stage, the Japanese patients fared better. And when they looked at the prognosis and survival of patients in the surgical um, uh, cohorts, like patients who underwent surgery, and um, kept the non-surgical patients apart and analyzed them separately, they found again that the survival of surgical patients and the non-surgical patients was better in, in Japan compared to the West. So what's happening? If you closely examine and try and understand the context and the, the practices in Japan and the US, both in terms of getting to the diagnosis and the investigations they have in the management pathways, you'll find a number of significant differences. There are differences in presentation. Gastric cancer is much more common in Japan. They do aggressive screening via endoscopy. They're looking for in situ tumors and pre-invasive tumors. They do a number of investigations generally, even in symptomatic patients, in terms of looking for spread of disease. There's obviously differences in the extent of surgery. Um, and for people who are probably not very familiar with gastric cancer surgery, a bit like me, this refers to the amount of lymph nodal dissection that people in Japan tend to do compared to their Western counterparts. They do a much more radical lymph nodal dissection, amongst others. So lots of differences between the Japanese um, management, diagnostic and management strategies and that in the West. And what then, the, what this leads to is a migration of patients down the stages. What does this mean? Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So you've got these different stages of uh, gastric cancer patients in Japan and in the US, and they obviously are drawn from a general, from the community in Japan and from the community in the US. Now, if you employ a screening strategy looking for gastric cancer in asymptomatic healthy individuals who might be at risk, then what you're doing effectively is bringing some patients from the community into stage one. If you then aggressively image them and you have slightly different classification systems, you might be pulling some otherwise stage one patients who might be stage one in the West to stage two because you're looking for um, the tumor infiltration across the wall a bit more closely, you're doing endoscopic ultrasounds and so on and so forth. And, and this is where it all started, the endoscopic ultrasound and so on in the 70s and 80s in Japan. If you do then more extensive surgery in your so-called stage two patients and you're doing D2 and D3 dissections and looking for um, tiny specks of a tumor in lymph nodes or lymph node micrometastasis, the moment you have a, micro, uh, a metastasis in a lymph node, you're moving patients to stage three. And if you follow the logic, the more investigations you do, the more you're likely to upstage patients from one to four, two to four, three to four, because if you do a uh, whole body CT scans, PET scans, radionuclide scans, and bone biopsies looking for cancer, you will find some patients within stage one, two, and three that you will then recategorize as stage four. So I hope you've been following what I'm saying. So what I'm saying effectively is that there is a migration of the cohorts down the stages, and this migration of cohorts or moving patients from the general population to stage one, stage one to stage two, stage two to stage three, and so on and so forth, improves the prognosis of each of these cohorts compared to the Americans who do not necessarily adopt these aggressive strategies. And therefore, these comparisons are flawed. And, and you shouldn't really be claiming that the treatment in Japan is better because this comparison is subject to what we call stage migration bias. So I hope um, uh, this uh, explanation of stage migration bias um, is uh, adequate because this is quite um, a common phenomenon, affects not just gastric cancer, but lots of other um, uh, cancers and also other diseases. And there's a link to a paper here that explains um, stage migration bias from the context of lung cancer. It was first described in the New England Journal of Medicine a few decades ago. And so it's a good read if you're interested. So keep in mind that stage migration bias can occur in a variety of scenarios. Primarily affects observational research, observational studies, 
And the potential solutions are essentially an awareness of this phenomenon, awareness of stage migration, and also um, the need for you to understand the population in which these studies are done and the setting, including the screening practices, the diagnostic practices, the investigations usually employed and how they can be different and then the treatment pathways. Okay, so we'll move on to another kind of bias that I think is quite interesting and is useful to keep in mind. This is what we call the immortal time bias or survivorship bias. Right, so in a study that compares different cohorts, the outcome of interest does not occur in a cohort for a specific time period. So this is what you need for survivorship bias to occur. I mean, this statement by itself may not make much sense, but hopefully the, an example will. So if you want to compare, let's say, cardiac bypass versus best medical treatment for a group of patients who, say, present with um, severe angina over a period of two to three years in a tertiary hospital like Sheffield, and you want to do a retrospective cohort study, then you have a group of patients who've had a bypass for angina, and you have a group of patients that have had best medical treatment. And let's say you find that cardiac bypass patients perform better. Now, this could be, this could well be, uh, because cardiac bypass is much more effective than best medical treatment. However, there's another potential reason. And this might uh, appear quite logical um, uh, as I explain. So the surgical group has probably survived the initial period after angina and are probably fitter because unless the patient has survived the angina and then be listed on, put on, uh, on a semi-urgent list and then had a bypass um, and then they've survived the time leading up to the bypass, they're not going to have the bypass. In other words, the surgical group could not have died early in the management pathway. In other words, they had to be immortal that's the reason for the name immortal time bias. They've had to be immortal in the early period to end up uh, having an operation. And the early deaths, the deaths that have probably occurred within the first few days or weeks, would have been classed as having best medical treatment in an observational study. And therefore, um, the best medical treatment will have quite a few patients who really are in the poor prognostic category. And therefore, this is not a fair comparison. And you should be very cautious about saying, oh, surgery is clearly more effective in these kinds of observational studies. OK, so you're probably not very interested if you're a general surgical trainee in the example I've given you. So let's look at an example from colorectal cancer. So this is a um, survival curve, uh, well, a set of survival curves. We've not talked about survival curves before, but, uh, but uh, hopefully we will do soon. Uh, so, so bear with me while I explain this curve. Um, they do say a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is a really interesting picture that gives a lot of information. So this survival curve gives you, there are four curves. These are all Kaplan-Meier curves. And the, you can see that the overall survival of patients with colorectal cancer uh, is indicated by this solid, maybe purple line. Patients who have stage three colorectal cancer and who have not undergone liver resection, obviously stage three patients don't, their survival is shown by this dotted, uh, sorry, dashed uh, blue line, slightly dark. The survival of patients who've had stage four disease and, there, and uh, um, not had liver resection are shown, is shown by this line here, as I'm pointing out. And the survival of patients who um, have stage four disease and liver meds and have had a liver resection is shown by this line here the faint dashed blue line. Now clearly, stage four patients are performing badly, but why are stage four patients who've had a liver resection doing better than stage three and the overall group? That's odd. So it's clearly um, uh, very, very likely that the, stage, uh, that the stage four patients who are undergoing a liver resection are probably the fitter of uh, the lot and they're able to sustain um, you know, liver uh, resection surgery, and there could be bias, the immortal time bias at play here. Now, if you talk to hepatobility pan pancreatic surgeons, liver surgeons, they're all very keen on saying, uh, on, on uh, doing liver resections for colorectal liver metastasis on the presumption that resection of colorectal liver metastasis improves survival. 
But this is from observational studies. There is no randomized controlled trial evidence, to my knowledge, that colorectal liver resection uh, improves um, the survival of these patients. So you've got to take this observational study data with a pinch of salt. You've got to think about whether immortal time bias could be at play here. But the other very interesting observation with this in this um, figure, um, to those uh, with a keen eye, is you might have observed that the three survival curves here of patients who've not had liver resections has an early dip and carries on and then plateaus. However, the patients who have had liver resection, they are plateauing first and then are dipping later. That itself is evidence that these are um, fitter patients because for most cancer survival um, curves or survival curves of patients with cancer, there's all, often or almost always an early dip indicating that pa some patients have aggressive disease and, and succumb from the disease and then you have a plateau. So this curve for liver resection is quite artificial and therefore you have to assume that immortal time bias is at, is at play here. And again, if you're really interested, there's a very interesting article in an epidemiology journal explaining this concept in a lot of uh, detail. Right. So what have we learned today? We've, we've talked about bias, the types of bias, and the fact that bias can occur anywhere along the, uh, along, uh, the path of a clinical study. And just keep in mind that bias is systematic while error is random. And like I say, bias can occur at any stage of a study. We've been talking about stage migration phenomenon, or some people call it the Will Rogers phenomenon, after the comedian that first talked about it. And this is important in epidemiological studies, primarily on cancer. And then we've talked about immortal time bias or survivorship bias. And just think of uh, the role of treatment pathways and how patients get onto specific treatments and um, when you're comparing different treatments, especially surgery versus non-surgical non -surgical treatment. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>